Okay. Hi, everybody, uh, and I welcome you to today's webinar on training in animal welfare. Um, I'm Alexander Rieck. I'm a scientist at the Friedrich Löffler Institute uh, here in Germany. And um, I'm also the work package leader of the work package animal health and welfare within the bovine uh, network, which the long name is Beef Innovation Network Europe. It's a new funded project and we are in our final year now. And it is financed under the Horizon 2020 program. And I will only very briefly before we start the talks, um, would like to introduce you to the um, project. So what is Bovine? Um, Bovine is a consortium of 18 partners from nine EU countries and the UK. Uh, the, the countries you can see here, it's France, Italy, Estonia, Germany, Ireland, Belgium, Portugal, Spain, Poland, and the UK. And institutions involved um, are very varied. We have beef associations, stakeholders, scientific institutions, university, but also farm advisory companies. And we have a website, which you can see here. That's the address. So you're welcome to visit the website and look up all the information we gathered so far. And how do we gather those informations? Um, um, Within the project, um, sort of through a bottom-up approach, we identify user needs and for which there might be actually solutions already out there, but are not widely distributed. And we um, tap into those reservoirs of underutilized knowledge that can be scientific publications or cray literature or whatever. And then we collate those information and into a tailored collection of best practices which we then share with our network, but also with all the uh, member countries. Um, and all the information we gather are in four different thematic, thematic areas. One thematic area is socioeconomic resilience. The other one is animal health and welfare, where we have this webinar for today. Then environmental sustainability and production efficiency and meat quality. And all the information gathered so far can be found on the Bovine Knowledge Hub on our website. Um, this is now uh, just a screenshot of uh, the one from Animal Health and Welfare. The same you can see also for the other semantic areas. And for each year, we have two priority topics for which we try to find uh, good practices and research innovations. And this year's priority topics in Animal Health and Welfare are on-farm health check for young stock prior to sale, including vaccination status. And the second one is training in animal welfare. And this is where our webinar will be based on today. And um, training in animal welfare is obviously not only um, a concern for farmers, but also for operators, handlers, transporters, and also slaughterhouses. And for that, we have a really interesting uh, panel of speakers today. First, we're gonna hear Isa Kernberger Fischer, She's also working at the Institute of Animal Welfare and Animal Husbandry at the, at the Friedrich Löffler Institute here in Germany. And she will talk about animal welfare during transport. Then we will hear George Stilwell and his students, Lua Reis and Melissa Naldo from the University of Lisbon from Portugal, as well as Diana Valante from the University of Vasco da Gama, also from Portugal. And then in the end, we will see some videos from Beatrice Miner. Monet from the Institut de la Vache in France. With that, I thank you for your attention. I heard um, the organizer will mute all the microphones of the audience. So if you have questions, you can type them in the comment section or wait for uh, after the talks are finished. I thank you and now I uh, hope we have a good webinar. Thank you. So hello to everyone. So I think, or I hope you will see my presentation in the real presentation mode. So um, thank you, Alex, for the nice introduction. So I would like to start on the topic, how to avoid stress when transporting cattle. 
Um, so animal welfare is affected by many stresses during the transport process. And the most stressful points are the not new unknown environment with a limited possibility to move, the physical exertion during unloading and loading and balancing the driving movements, the close physical contact to unfamiliar conspecifics and no possibility to escape, the fitness, health status and also the preparation for transport, changing climate conditions and extreme temperatures, as well as handling and a changed feed and water supply. So these aspects, as well as transport duration, loading density, vehicle design and trailer microclimate, have been covered in a large number of studies in which transport is defined as a stressful procedure with main danger animal welfare and which even increases mortality among the transported animals. So as transport challenges the animals a lot, we should and we can do some things to facilitate the journey for the animals. And therefore, on the basis of these aspects, I would like to move through this lecture. So first of all, we have to think about our management. So follow watering and feeding intervals, journey times and resting periods, thinking about handling in a gentle, slow and quiet manner. Then also we have to get knowledge about physiology and behavior of cattle. Then we should only transport fit, prepared and healthy animals. And we have to think about the resources. So include weather conditions in your route planning and follow the provisions for all means of transport. Um, but first, we should have a very brief look on the legal requirements for transport. So the regulation 1-2005 provides the framework for the transport of animals and can thereby partly protect animals from suffering and pain during the transport. Although here a lot of issues uh, concerning animal welfare are addressed. Uh, the regulation has a lot of shortcomings in terms of protecting animals. For example, temperature requirements only for road transport over eight hours. And here no humidity is included. And also the re regulation is not very species specific. And the most important article I want to mention is Article 3. So no person shall transport animals or cause animals to be transported in a way likely to cause injury or undue suffering to them. So I don't want to focus on other requirements because I think you could look this up yourself. So now I will start with the both aspects, knowledge about behavior and physiology and handling in a gentle manner. So in particular, as you already probably already noticed, extensive forms of husbandry for beef production on pasture or grassland often lead to cattle that are shy of people due to the low human animal contact. And this makes it difficult to handle them in situations where it is necessary and leads to stress for both for the animals and the humans. And such situations might be transports, which demand a lot from the animals regarding physical and mental stress. So one method to reduce stress is to get the animals used to human handling beforehand and to understand as a person handling the cattle, how cattle perceive their environment. And in this regard, I really like one very true sentence from Ronald Rongen, slow down, we don't have time. So which clearly indicates that in order to move cattle quickly, they must be given time to orientate themselves so that they can feel safe in an unfamiliar surrounding in accompanied by unfamiliar conspecifics and handled by unfamiliar persons. So Ronald as a trainer for low stress stockmanship and the five uh, is a trainer for low stress stockmanship and the five rules are cattle want to see who or what is driving them, cattle want to go where they are looking at, and movement creates movement and animals follow each other. Animals focus on one thing at a time, so in motion they cannot look for an escape route and therefore it is important to keep animals moving all times during moving them or loading them. And cattle have little patience. So cattle um, have a different range of vision and hearing than humans, which is important to know regarding low stress handling of cattle particularly during all stages of transport and during the pre-transport -trans pre preparation of cattle. So cattle perceive sounds in the range of 23 to 35,000 hertz, whereas the hearing range of humans is between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So accordingly, 
cattle are more sensitive, especially to higher and also to louder sounds. The fact that lightning technology, in particular modern LED lights, can also be lead to irritation of cattle due to ultrasonic noises, which is perceived by cattle but not heard by humans, should be also take, uh, taken into account. So um, the vision, um, the cattle see almost all around. Their range of vision is 330 degrees, of which only 30 degrees are seen three-dimensionally. Um, within these 330 degrees, the vision in the periphery is blurred, and there are two blind spots where cattle cannot see people or objects. And this is directly in the front um, of the forehead and behind the cattle. So cattle are also able to distinguish red from blue or green lights. However, they showed a very limited ability to distinguish green from blue um, lights. Uh, this is consistent with the dichromatic vision in cattle, whereas humans are trichromats. At night, cattle see better than humans, and this is due to the reflective um, pigment layer in the eye. This is called tapetum lucidum which directs more light into the eye. And however, the pigment layer also makes cattle much more sensitive to light reflections and also to light-dark contrasts. And the adaption from light to dark takes about five times longer in cattle than in humans, and therefore cows often refuse to go into dark rooms. And here the targeted use of a light can help to encourage cattle to walk without having stress or be uh, having fear. So. Also, um, I want to mention that the single image perception of humans is around 15 to 16 images per second. In cattle, this value is 60, uh, 50 to 60 frames per second, and therefore, depending on the lightning, moving images are not always perceived by cows as a fluid movement. And also, lightning with an alternating current, especially in the modern LEDs, goes on and off 100 times at 50 hertz and therefore perceived as flickering by the cattle, whereas we wouldn't notice that flickering. And cattle have also a poor depth perception and a poor estimation of distances. So another impressive aspect, is, uh, which is important in relation to handling, is that cattle prefer the left orientation. So our cattle, um, um, yeah, they are left orientated, so due to the left eye of the cattle triggers the right hemisphere of the brain where the risk analysis takes place. And to perceive and analyze the risk, they have to perceive this with the left eye. And therefore, cattle prefer to run in the left direction. And driving is therefore much more easy, easier and more stressless if the drive eye is laid out in the left direction. Another basic requirement for stress-free driving is to know about the zone concept of cattle. And uh, the, these zones are individual to each animal. So it is not possible to say in general terms at what distance from the animal each zone is located. Especially in dairy herds, these zones are closer to the animal than in suckler cows because the constant direct contact with people. So now I have a short video for you about the, in German it's called Echemarkuhbrille, and in English it's Echemarkau glasses or something like that, so which was developed and designed by Benito Weiser in Germany. And the software makes it possible to see a simulation in real time with the following effects. So you have a 330 degrees all around vision with only 30 degrees sharp vision in the front area. You have an increased adaption time which changes in brightness. The different color discrimination of cattle is also taken into account and an increased perception of reflections and contrasts, as well as the visual acuity is reduced to 30% of the human visual acuity, except in the 30 degrees frontal area. So now you will see the person wearing these uh, glasses is leaving the stable and it's a very shiny day, very bright outside. Now, when you are a cow, you won't see anything, so the cow will stop because the adaption takes some time. And now the person is entering the stable again, and here you can see that it also takes some time um, until the eyes adapt to the changing lightning. 
So here's another video which shows how shadows are perceived by cows so that they refuse to move on. So now the cows, they are wondering if this is uh, only a shadow or if it's a hole. So I think they will would feel um, very unsafe and insecure. So the person handling the cattle have to give the security that it's only a shadow and then they move on. Um, so the figure shows how we should drive cattle. I think you will know this. And in addition, here are the few rules that must be respected, especially for loading and unloading. So they let the animals be active themselves, ensure that they uh, the way is not obstructed. Food as a reward is far behind the animal's desire for security and safety. Handling with a positive attitude, um, with a walking space of approximately four kilometers per hour and do not chase the animals. Only drive them when they have enough space. Do not shout or hit the animal. Give cattle time to orientate and stand to the side of the cattle so that they can see who is moving them and constantly watch for changes in the behavior. So now we switch mainly to the aspects of route planning in regards to weather conditions. And I would like to inform you about a very few important basic requirements for transporting animals. And as you probably um, no, we distinguish between the short and the long distance transports. The short transports may last up to eight hours and long distance transports can last over eight hours. So transport duration includes the entire transport process from dispatch to the destination. The European Court of Justice rules that parts of the journey outside the EU must be organized according to Council Regulation 1 2005 until the animal reaches the destination. So transport starts with the movement of the first animal with the beginning of loading and ends at the destination with the unloading of the last animal from the vehicle. And the transport to the place of destination must take place without delays. So heat stress is one major animal welfare issue in terms of transporting animals and therefore there are temperature requirements for road transport where there are none for sea transport. A ventilation systems on means of transport by road shall be designed and maintained in such a way that at any time during the journey, the temperature range from five to 30 degrees Celsius can be maintained within the means of transport for all animals with a five degrees Celsius tolerance. And in order to avoid heat stress during transport, some better practices can be implemented. This is um, standing vehicle, standing vehicles should always be parked at right angles to the wind direction to support flushing the vehicle with fresh air and fans integrated in the vehicle can also be used to, uh, for this purpose. Um, then husbandry handling and assembling before and after the transport have a greater influence on the thermoregulation, so on the higher body temperature than the transport process themselves and the temperature changes during transport. So handling is very important. So also keep longer standing times at high amb ambient temperature as short as possible and what is also important, heart rate and body temperature show that the highest stress occurs during loading and unloading. So now I would like to give you a very brief overview about the transport of animals by sea and the related major, major animal welfare hazards, which are set out in detail within these uh, ANET report on animal welfare and sea vessels. Um, the first stage during the sea journey is the arrival in the port. Um, animals are brought to ports by road uh, transport vehicles in Spain, Portugal, Ireland, France and Romania. Most animals are sourced nationally and transported by road under eight hours. hours. And here the coordination of logistics appears to be much more better than when animals come from different member states, which is the case for Croatia and Slovenia. So um, as criticized by the authors, only a few checks by official vets are performed in 2018 in EU ports and only 31.6% cattle consignments and 3.5% sheep consignments exported by livestock vessels from the EU were entered in the traces system. And in southern EU ports, uh, temperature frequently exceeds 30 degrees, the maximum allowed temperature on board 
of a road transport vehicle above which uh, transport should not be approved. And as the temperature inside a parked vehicle is usually higher than outside, NGOs documented animals with heat stress signs inside road vehicles waiting in different EU ports due to the lack of ventilation systems or because the, vent the vehicle's ventilation system are incapable uh, of maintaining the required range of temperature. So um, the authors highlighted the good practice of Spain where a gradual arrival of trucks is implemented and that in one port shadowing are installed to keep trucks a little cooler during the waiting times. So during loading stage, uh, the authors pointed out that after the arrival at the port, animals are usually reloaded directly from the truck to the vessel via rams and gangways of varying quality without having a resting time. Ports have insufficient capacity or stables of stables or stables without using them. Um, proper inspection and isolation of unfit animals is mostly impossible. Records of uh, unofficial fitness for transport checks are poor or lack, and therefore there is a underreporting of unfit animals back to the member states of departure, which prevents from further improvement. Uh, the probability of unfit animals increases with increasing length of the journey by road, extreme weather, and the lack of competence of the supervisors. Euthanasia is rarely performed in ports, probably due to the inadequate um, contingency plans. And um, also uh, mentioned is the improper handling of animals leading to escapes, falling to the water, swimming in the sea, and animals caught were directly loaded without uh, a veterinary check. So um, NGOs also report on hitting, kicking, stressing the animals and an overview, overuse of electric prods. So um, the good practice is from Ireland. Here the loading procedures are fully supervised by veterinary and technical officers. Mm, during the actual sea journey, animals are confronted with lots of issues uh, which may endanger their health and welfare. And one key finding within the report was that there's a huge lack of information and statistics on health and animal welfare regarding sea transports. And in contrast to legal requirements, most member states uh, don't receive any information about conditions during the sea transport. And it was noted that in general, animal welfare depends on the quality of the vessel, which is very poor for most approved livestock carriers at the moment. Um, the conditions during the journey are not monitored and therefore some indicators as motility may help us to get an impression about the status quo. So as major indicator, the mortality rate can be referred as an iceberg indicator, but mortality rates only reflect extreme welfare issues and there is no official data on the prevalence. However, NGOs report on mortality rates. And despite improved regulations, mort mortalities still occur. Um, so, um, yeah, some good examples um, were also mentioned in the report. Um, one fact um, is that, um, so we have um, in Ireland and Romania and Portugal some good practices um, and, and from Australia is very good um, practice here. Um, they publish every six months um, the mortalities on the Australian Ministry of Agriculture's webpage. And uh, one uh, fact also mentioned um, by the authors in this report is the lack of surveillance by official vets during sea journey, which leads to a lack of information about mortalities, the causes of death and concerning and a lack about uh, the euthanasia method applied. And um, here we have also a better practice from Ireland. Here it is um, required uh, that there is a official veterinarian present um, but only on the first journey of a newly approved vessel. So other factors which uh, compromise animal welfare and health are heat stress, um, also insufficient ventilation, which leads to um, high ammonia concentrations, as well as other factors, for example, the lightning schedule on the ship. Sometimes the light is switched on uh, the whole time. 
And here we have also better practice. New Zealand uh, decided to ban exports of live animals by sea. And in May 2020, Australia amended its law to enhance uh, the protection of animals at sea, including temporary bans on transporting sheep to the Middle East during the summer. So um, after the sea journey, the transport is not finished. Actually, the EU, EU law protects animals until they reach their final destination, as confirmed by the European Court of Justice. Um, but there's uh, usually no system in place for the inspection of animals and no feedback mechanism, which leads to a huge amount of underreporting on injured, sick and also dead animals. So um, we have an example for um, where 40 um, cattle died during the um, time after the arrival. And um, so not only deaths on board are under report, but also transport related deaths after arrival. So after arrival in third countries, animals are confronted with inf an infrastructure that is not comparable to the EU and trucks that do not meet EU requirements. Reports by NGOs, um, they uh, mentioned loading uh, despite hot temperatures and a lack of readiness uh, for some animals, overcrowding and also legs which were trapped. Um, and some states have new animal welfare requirements, uh, for example, prohibiting the transport over uh, 32 degrees Celsius, but NGOs still found uh, many transports in which the rules are not respected. So a better practice example from Ireland is, um, is um, the only, Ireland is the only member state uh, that has um, requirements for the export uh, of animals to Libya. So in the last few minutes, I would switch mainly to the aspects of fitness for transport as well as preparation for the intended journey. And so it is known that the probability that animal welfare during transport will not be compromised increases if adverse effects of negative pre-transport factors are reduced as much as possible. And therefore the pre-transport preparation of animals plays an important, if not essential role. So fortunately, um, the major, the majority of the factors influencing animal welfare during the pre-transport phase can be affected by management and thus it is possible to reduce adverse effects on animal well-being and stress induction. So um, various factors prior to the beginning of the actual transport may influence the development of stress. So we can um, distinguish between short-term factors um, which um, are, for example, handling at loading or fasting, then middle term factors, uh, for example, pre transport nutrition and mixing with unfamiliar animals, and long term uh, factors regarding the form of housing or the human animal contact. So, the selection of animals to travel must include checks for fitness and preparedness for the transport regarding the category and also the length of the planned route or journey. So increased attention on vulnerable cattle categories should be paid. So on cool cattle with low um, economic value and calves. So weaning is one of the most stressful times in a calf's life. So what I can say is preconditioned calves will shrink less during transport. So unfortunately, there is no concept of what fitness for transport is and also drivers as well as official vets even find it hard to decide whether an animal is fit or not for the attendant journey. So the regulation 1-2005 only defines the unfitness for transport. So what it is stated is that um, the fitness for transport is required in addition to the avoidance of unnecessary injury and suffering is checked with regard to the planned transport, is confirmed by a veterinarian and has to be unsured until loading, um, unloading at the place of destination. And here are some aspects. So not fit for transport are injured animals and animals with physiological weaknesses and pathological conditions, animals with large open wounds and severe organ prolapses, pregnant animals in an advanced stage of gestation, cows up to seven days after birth, young animals with unhealed umbilical wounds, and calves younger than 10 days 
of age on routes um, over 100 kilometers and lactating animals which are not accompanied by their lactating offspring if milking um, cannot be ensured within 12 hours. So finally, as a take-home message, remember that cattle see the world with different eyes and hear the world with different ears, which can help us to handle them with less stress and which will facilitate the journey for the animals as well. And also remember that animals can be prepared for these situations. So thank you very much for listening and yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> I don't know if we continue or if there's questions. No, we continue. Okay, so we, you can see my screen now. Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is George Stewell. I'm a, a member of the Bovine team of coming from Portugal. And uh, related to this uh, issue of certification of animal welfare, so I've been working with a, a work package uh, on animal health and welfare. And we're going to do this presentation um, on uh, welfare assessment of uh, suckler cows. So animals in extensive systems, uh, cows with their calves, and the way to assess uh, the welfare. This work <clears throat> has, been, has been done uh, also by the studies of uh, uh, two student, students of mine, Melissa Naldo and Loire de Reij, and also a colleague that, uh, that I uh, supervised in a project in a postdoc, uh, um, no, postgraduate course uh, called Diana Valiant. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, the, the suckler herds, and this is because, of course, with the new with a new um, strat strategy for the European Union called or known as Farm to Fork. Of course, this wants to um, certify the welfare of animals from farm to fork, as the name says. So this, uh, the, the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork aims also to reward those uh, farming systems that manage lands in a uh, nature friendly way, but also to um, try to get farmers to adopt practice that are better for, for animal welfare. And this will mean that these, these farms will, and this is another reason to certify these farms, these farms may get uh, extra payment for the, 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 the CAP payments. Um, if, if the, the standards of the welfare of their animals is uh, above uh, what legislation um, comply or to forces. So this, this is a reason, apart from the ethical reason, uh, this is a good reason to start certifying the uh, animals, the bovine, the cattle from farm to fork. Um, Including this uh, idea of a more sustainable uh, beef production, it is, is, of course, the relation between antimicrobial resistance and animal welfare. We know that uh, when we get and we, uh, and we certify that uh, the welfare of our beef cattle is uh, uh, optimum or increase uh, the welfare, we know that uh, antimicrobial use will be reduced. And so this is also a way of uh, fighting antimicrobial resistance that is a worldwide uh, concern at the moment. So the, in the future, and the things are going that way, um, we may get in the future um, a label uh, European transversal trans, well, across all countries um, on the welfare. Uh, there are some two studies or reports at the moment, one ordered or by, by the European Parliament and the other one by the European Commission, um, in which they all not only have studied what's being done 
across Europe, but also proposing new solutions. This uh, uh, list you do have here called Hon Honest Labeling Matrices is from the Compassion World Farming uh, Association, so it's not the a European proposal, but it's uh, this kind of uh, labeling that perhaps we're going to, to get in the future. So, um, why, why look at the uh, suckler herds? We know that the, the main um, protocols to assess welfare uh, look at uh, intensive farming, dairy farming, and also the fattening and finishing part of uh, beef production, but very few look at the suckler, at the suckler herd. So this is my um, introduction, and now we'll uh, now pass to Luar. Luar Nell has been doing some work, but she will also talk about how to uh, or what are the ideas behind the protocol that we've been using. Luar, are you ready? Uh, yes, hi. Okay, so I'll put on your, your slide. Okay, so the floor is yours. Hello, Luar? Hi, ah, sorry, ah. This, okay, here it is. Sorry, yeah. wasn't seeing it. So uh, the protocol me and my colleagues were uh, working on and what we applied to our works was based on the welfare quality for fattening cattle and the New Zealand protocol for extensive beef systems. Uh, this is more or less what that looks like. So we have four welfare principles and their corresponding criteria. In an audit, we use measures or, indi or indicators like body condition score and room and fuel score to assess absence of hunger distance and availability of water for absence of thirst. For an appropriate environment, thermal comfort means there is enough shade for the animals to rest and cool, and ease of movement means there are no dangerous objects or terrain for them. For good health, we look for injuries and diseases or the lack of them, and that's how painful procedures are done. Last but not least, the appropriate uh, behavior. This is where stock personship and animal handling is evaluated, not only by animal-based measures, so how the animals react to being handled, but also by stock personship and resource-based measures, measures like miscatches, hitting, noise, health checks, and yarding frequency. Okay, questionnaire. Uh, this is also an important complementary tool we use to gather information that we cannot find on the field by direct observation. Uh, it includes questions like mortality and morbidity in the last 12 months, some reproductive questions, painful procedures including castration, dehoarding or debanding, ear tagging and branding. Not only at what age they, uh, they are done, but also how they're done. So the methods uh, and if anesthesia or any pain reliever is used. Also included in the questionnaire are some resource-based measures, like the walking distance to water points that the animals have to, to do, the number of water points and presence or not of still water. Also, shade availability and dangerous objects in the field. So, some initial difficulties I came across start with an unwillingness on behalf of the farmers to gather the animals for an audit. Uh, it wasn't with malintent, it's just because it was a very time-consuming effort and a very stressful one. So, what ended up happening is that the audit was done during other procedures, like the uh, vaccination day. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the welfare quality protocol, you already know it's not a very recommended thing to do. Uh, the QBA, or the qualitative, qualitative behavior assessment, uh, which is when we just observe the animals in their natural states for about 20 minutes, was not applied. Why? Well, because I said, like I said before, it's a very stressful day, so they wouldn't be on their normal behavior. So if you really wanted to do it, you'd have to do it either the day before or the day after the visit which invalidates the sparenter for these types of animals. 
another difficulty was maybe uh, or maybe an inconvenience I, I still don't know uh, was the structural kind some shoots where the clinical observation is made are like two solid walls of concrete or metal, making it very hard to see the animal in its entirety. Okay, so I'm back, although this is uh, Diana Valiant uh, work. And so with, with uh, uh, Diana applied this protocol, similar to what uh, Luar was just uh, uh, describing, and she applied it to three autochthonous breeds, uh, Portuguese autochthonous breeds. Um, you can see the uh, two of them are beef breeds. The other one is a breed for bullfighting. So it's a breed, a, a local breed, but the animals uh, are not bred for meat, but, or, although they, they will be um, uh, eventually sent to slaughter for, for meat, but the idea is to produce uh, animals and the animals that are not at ease with the, with people, of course, uh, and they are quite wild. So Diana applied the, the protocol to, to different uh, herds of these three uh, breeds. And you know, so the Brava is the, the wild one, the, the, the bullfighting breed. Cachena is the, with the long horns coming from the mountains in the north of Portugal, although the, the, these uh, herds were in the lowlands. And Germalista also for, they were not in their right place, but they're, 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 they're a breed that's uh, uh, becoming quite rare, and so some breeders are keeping them for to save the, the, the breed. So this this uh, protocol was applied to 300 animals, 301 animals in uh, end of last year. So in a summary, uh, these these were some of the uh, the indicators that were collected. Uh, like what I was saying, some at uh, at the uh, um, at the race uh, when they were being handled for other reasons, and, and some looking at the, at the pasture or the place where, where they live. And you can see the classifications on the four criteria was uh, quite good in almost all of the breeds. And uh, the, the, the uh, Brava breed, of course, had a less, uh, less uh, uh, grade in animal-human uh, relation but with, between a Y, uh, but uh, almost all of them has quite a, a large, uh, a good uh, uh, grade. And fa uh, the farm for Germolista, so the, uh, it was a very small farm with only, I'm not sure yet, but I think 17 animals. And they had uh, a low, uh, low classification in uh, health and, and injuries because only one or two animals showed an injury. But that, of course, is a quite a high percentage taking into account that it's they only had 17 animals, the, the herd. So this this was a, a way of uh, classifying these uh, these herds so that uh, the certification for a good welfare from farm to fork is uh, complete. And the, what the Diana found also has uh, things to change perhaps, um, is that in future, uh, uh, future studies also look at uh, more at uh, animal handling and uh, mean age of the, of the herds to see how the longevity of these animals uh, also, if these animals have been transported, because this, of course, is something that we saw in the presentation before, it's a stressful moment. So if we get herds that do not transport too much the animals, that's uh, uh, much better. And also uh, things like uh, uh, respiratory rate has a heat stress uh, uh, indicator and, and the panting score and the animal branding that is not in the welfare quality uh, protocol, uh, but especially in this Brava breed, it is very uh, usual to brand these, these animals. Melissa, that's going to talk after me, she will also say something about this branding because she 
She did the same, the, the same kind of work, but with the herds in Mozambique, in Africa, and in Portugal, trying to see how, what difference we could find between two very different countries and very different environments. So, Melissa, if you're there, your slide is next. Okay, thank you, Professor. Hi, everyone. So, my study is about the welfare of grazing beef cattle in Mozambique and in Portugal, with the objective of observing the differences between these countries and finding uncommon practices that can be used in the future. While also analyzing the audit protocol and extensive animals to observe its efficiency. The size of my sample varied between 60 and 150 cattle and comprised of Bos Indix animals from Mozambique and Bos Taurus cattle from Portugal. Uh, mm -hmm. I obtained the various results of the different parameters that I evaluated, but these were the most important ones and the clinical evaluation, which I will show you afterwards. So when I tried doing the avoidance distance, I was able to perform this on four of the six farms I evaluated and the results are posted on the table. Plus I was also able to touch the animals from the second and third farm and the workers from the sixth farm were, would touch the cows. This shows that these farms have a good human animal relationship, which can come from handling quality, uh, the frequency of handling or the type of breed. The, Mo the Mozambican farms did have a more frequent handling than the Portuguese farms, and that could be the main reason why these farms had a better result. However, the importance of a good worker with the knowledge of cow behavior and how to act around these animals will lead to a better worker-animal relationship, calmer animals, and it will lead to a better environment. In regard to the ACPC, which in English means the behavior evaluation in the holding pen, this has the same method of evaluation as the QBA, but the objective was to try and understand the relationship of the animals with the handlers, but also to, con to evaluate the comfort and safety that these animals felt at the moment of handling. Farms two, three, four, and six had the best results with the highest expression of relaxed and friendly herds. There was also the presence of certain negative descriptors, but these were associated with bad handling. So what was up for what? On this slide, we have the clinical results. Uh, these parameters were classified with zero if they were good, one if they were acceptable, or two if they were bad. The criteria for classifying the results were based on a study that happened in New Zealand uh, that Luard told about, said about. Um, diarrhea was present in the Portuguese farms, but this can occur because of the high availability of fresh grass, which leads to a low intake of effective fiber, which is why it's important to assure the availability, the availability of straw. The integument injury is present in the Mozambican farms, but most of these lesions were derived from tick bites because this parasite is an infection infestation in this region, which is also why there is a more frequent handling of the animals. The best results were from farms where the owners would visit daily, and the Portuguese farms had better results in terms of health parameters because of the, vet, the better veterinary assistance, but the Mozambican farms had more fam familiarity and a closer proximity to, to the animals. So what was up for it? While doing the audits to the farms, I found it was quite difficult to evaluate with calm and caution to detail on the Portuguese farms because of the working speed and because they did not let me do the evaluation in the holding pen first before they started working. Because of this, the Portuguese farms had to have two people evaluating at the same time in contrast to the Mozambican farms that only had one. At the end of this study, I would rearrange the audit protocol so the ACPC would be longer and could be done with the help of cameras. I would evaluate the holding facilities because these impact the flow of movement and the need for rough handling. I would also specify and count the negative behaviors of the handlers, and I would evaluate the different and I would evaluate different animals in the pen and in the shoot. That's absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, so this this was our presentation. Um, we go back to Alex. Thank you very much, George, and thanks all of you. Lia, uh, I have a bit of difficulty pronouncing yeah. it right. I hope Melissa and Diana. And now we we go to uh, Beatrice, uh, who will show us some videos. 
Yes. Do you see my screen? I hope so. Okay, thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Beatrice Munex. I work uh, as a, I, I'm a member of the Bovine team and uh, I work in Institut Les Vaches, which is a French livestock institute. And I'm a scientist in health and welfare of cattle. So today I will present you an innovative training uh, of farmers on welfare, which has been developed by a consultant, Pauline Garcia. Uh, first of all, Pauline is a farmer. She raises salers and obrac uh, suckler cows. And she is also a consultant as animal behaviorist. And as such, she, she has developed a farm training for farmers but also vets and technicians to improve the human to cattle relationship and of course welfare ultimately. So she publishes videos to complete the training and I wish will show you two of them today to illustrate the training and because she cannot be here today with us. So let's see the first one. Okay, so in her training sessions, uh, she explains the behavior of cattle to help farmers better understand the way cattle feels and gets into contact with their environment. And here you can see how cows seek uh, to, for scratchings. Again, trees, for instance, um, the head, the neck, of course. How they like to scratch or get into contact with uh, congeners a little further. Yes, here it is. And then Pauline will use uh, this natural behavior to build a positive relationship with her cattle. So, for instance, during the training, here it comes. Okay, here it is. She Okay, this is here. So uh, during the training, she will explain how to get cattle used to be brushed on the very same areas of the body they, will like, to, they like to scratch. And this should be done regularly, uh, especially around the weaning for a week or two to install a positive relationship at a very sensitive stage for hyphers. Uh, and winning is the, this is not an alphas, obviously, but you will see the alphas later on. <laughs> uh, winning is a, really the proper period to work with cattle and to install a durable and even uh, everlasting uh, positive relationship with the cattle. Here you can see the he, the hyphas. So she explained how to brush them uh, with the brush, but later on you will see with hand. I will go further on. Yeah, here it is. And of course, cat, adult cattle uh, should be brushed from time to time as a positive routine. And this can be done both inside and, and outside also uh, during uh, regular visits of the herd. So during the training, uh, Pauline uh, will also explain explain how to get young cattle um, used to novelty. You will see in a minute. Where is it? Okay, here it is. And um, see, she can even train them. She, she, she trained people how to move them, uh, to get them used to collaborate with the farmer whenever, whenever it will be necessary and, and to remain confident in the farmer in any farm, farm in any farm situation this is where she trains eifers and this is a way to uh, install a positive relationship with the cattle so let me show you another video in a minute here it is and you will see um, a relevant application of this training so you see the video is it okay? Okay. So in this video, she will show you uh, that because the cattle are highly confident and calm, she can even treat them outside at pasture without any handling equipment. And you will see 
also without much effort either. Okay, let me show the video. Okay, so here again, she insists on the behavior of cattle and shows how to hide the white bottle to avoid to raise alert in cows because they are very sensitive to bright colors. And then, in a minute, uh, okay, here it comes. Okay, and then she used the brush. Because they were used to the brush when they were young, it is used to as a positive reinforcement, and you will see a, a way to re-ensure and to get into contact, in a positive contact with the animal. And you can see in the video how she gets into contact with the brush, and then she can treat them one by one, you will see. The hurt is calm, quiet. She is also very quiet. She moves smoothly. Uh, she is calm. She explains how to observe the animal and see how relaxed it is. And she can treat standing animals and you will see also lying animals. Here it is. First, she gets into contact and then she can treat it. And you will see later that some of them are even very collaborative. They are seeking for contact. Here it is. Okay. So by the end, what could have been a very organized handling procedure has turned into a quiet and comfortable operation, as you can see, showing some evidence of the benefit for the farmer to build such a, and to keep such a positive human to animal relationship in the herd. So my point was uh, to show you this um, kind of training because um, it is based, of course, on scientific evidences regarding the behavior of cattle, the cognitive and memory capacities. Um, Isa, uh, by, at the beginning of the webinar, show you some of the um, uh, vision characteristic and, and, and how uh, cattle react. So Pauline explained all this. But then um, what is interesting in the training is that she gives practical examples of good practice to install and to keep this positive relationship with the, from the very young age. And the training demonstrates the benefit um, of it for both cattle and farmer, on, um, or, or for even when the, the, the cattle are adult. So what is innovative is both the training, but also the fact that Pauline Garcia releases free online videos like this one to promote good practices but also to motivate farmers, vets, and technicians to attend to, to the training. So that was my presentation. <laughs> it was easy for me. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Very nice videos. Uh, thanks all the panelists again, also Isa and all the students of George. And we are nearly on the dot at six or five, or depending where you are, but I think we would have time for a few questions. Um, maybe you would need to help us a bit now because I, I, if I would see questions, I would see them in the chat box or would you only see them? Um, you would see them in the chat box, yes, but we have okay. not had any questions come in at the moment. So if anybody from the audience would like to ask a question, please enter your question in the questions box made available to you there and we'll be able to answer those questions for you. Okay. So maybe we can wait one or two minutes and for the people if they have questions to type them in. I maybe have one um, regarding the, uh, now where I had it, the um, welfare indicators from Lua. 
um, I hope I still pronounced this correctly. Um, what kind of welfare indi in indicators did you use? Because I also know the welfare assessment protocol. Did you use all of them or did you choose certain indicators that had a, a especially strong impact or how did you choose those indicators? Uh, yes, so uh, I didn't use all of them. I used uh, I used some of the welfare quality protocol and some from the New Zealand protocol, um, because and because of the welfare quality, because it's uh, for intensive um, production, some of them don't make sense in an extensive system. I don't know if I, I'm being clear. Yeah, no, no, that was clear. I understand this because some obviously won't make sense in an intensive or extensive, depending what systems you use. Uh, George, yeah. Can I, can I just add something? Um, this was a sequence of uh, studies, and the first study was by Diana, Diana Valiant, with the three, um, and she uh, more or less, well, taking into account the, the New Zealand study that did, that looked at the welfare quality protocol and a protocol from AC Davis, uh, California, and yeah. they decided what to take out and what to add because we didn't just take out some indicators. We replaced some of them with indicators that were more uh, adapted and reliable for, for extensive systems. So Diana was the first one to do that. And Luar and Melissa more or less took up what, what was done by Diana, improved it a little bit, but uh, uh, the sequence was uh, that. That's why the results from Diana, uh, they're now going to be published, I hope, if, <laughs> if they accept it, but uh, will be will be published. Very nice. Yes, Beatrice. Can I, yes, please, can I ask a question? Um, I, I'm very interested in the ACPC uh, <laughs> observation. Would it be quick to explain uh, what it is about and uh, what, what are the the indicators, please. I will start and then Melissa will, will go with. Melissa wanted to do the QBA. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the QBA. Um, but the QBA is uh, 20 minutes in looking at animals in their natural setting uh, and not in a holding pen. And like Luar was saying, um, this is not easy to do in commercial farms because or you go there the day before or you get the animals already in the holding pen uh, waiting to go into the race. And so I suggested because uh, uh, Melissa did the, the QBA to these animals and I said, no, you can't call it QBA because QBA has some rules and you're not fulfilling the rules of QBA. So let's get another name. And so we invented this name of uh, behavior in the holding pen. And uh, the, Melissa, do you want to uh, explain what, what, you, uh, what you did? Okay. Uh, basically what I did was in the holding pen. I would either be outside looking at the general behavior of the herd or in some farms I could be inside the holding pen. And I would observe, um, I have a set of descriptors that I would uh, evaluate. For example, if the herd was mostly relaxed, I would put most rela mostly relaxed. If it was indifferent, I would put indifferent. Um, but the objective was to see how the herd uh, felt in their behaviors in the moment uh, before the actual handling, but they already had some handling because they had to be put in the holding pen. I thought it was uh, very curious to do because in the Mozambican farms, what happened was the animals would be put in the holding pen a day or two before, and they would be accustomed to it because they, it is also very frequent. For example, um, the most frequent farm I had in terms of handling was the first farm, they would handle their animals once every week. And with, it was interesting to see the completely different behaviors because the Mozambican farms had uh, more relaxed and friendly animals in terms to the Portuguese farms where they were more, um, I won't say afraid, but they were more... Uh, anxious, more anxious and uh, 
more anxious and stressed than the, than the Mozambican ones. For me, it That's was a surprise. I thought to the, the Mozambican ones with a very large uh, surrounding, so they would be in a huge pasture. I would say that they would be more frightened to go next to the race, but uh, it was the opposite. They, they were very, Melissa said, very tame. Yes, and some would be uh, very, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Brahman cows, but these cows are very anxious. And because of the good quality of handling, they were very tame. The cow I was petting was a Brahman. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question in the chat, that maybe I just read it. I'm not sure to whom it responds, but I just read it. What is the scope for inclusion of positive welfare and providing positive experience to animals, not just prevent negative ones? Oh. Anybody comments on that? Maybe Beatrice? Yes. <laughs> it would be another webinar because uh, there are <laughs> many evidence of uh, the benefits to include positive um, experience uh, because um, this will decrease the stress. Uh, this uh, will uh, improve the immunity because it decreases the stress. Uh, it will improve uh, and facilitate the work with the animals. And this is very important in cattle because, uh, uh, well, in most most uh, French uh, systems, um, there there are many contacts between human and cattle. So the the easier and the safer the safest uh, these contacts are, the better it is for both animal and human. And um, you can there, there are there are many evidence published evidence of the benefit up to the quality of the meat at the slaughterhouse um, when, when cattle were raised in positive and calm um, ambience, then you have a better quality of meat or you have less problem of quality um, and especially pH quality um, at the slaughtering. I don't know if I'm clear in my answer. It was quick, but... Uh... Well, it was a good answer, I think. Um, are there more chats here? Uh, as a veterinarian, how can we change our behavioral or behavior approach to increase the animal welfare of the animals as a veterinarian? Oh, actually, I'm not veterinarian, so I don't know. Well, I know the work of a vet, but uh, maybe the, um, I, I would, I would <laughs> give the answer to you, but <laughs> once again... Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think it's uh, the question is not just a veterinarian. I would say anyone working with animals, uh, uh, how can we change our behavior? And I think your videos are fantastic. It shows that uh, by gentle approaching and from very small, and that's that's perhaps the secret. So you can't do it when they they're already cows. With them. you have to start when they're very small. I also have experience with my sister that has a, a large herd. When she uh, milk feeds, uh, bottle feeds uh, calves from a young age, because they're orphan or for some reason, when they get to old cows, so 10, 12 years afterwards, they still run from the other side of the pasture to come and greet her. So what you do to them in, as a small calf will stay for life. Yeah. And maybe uh, to, to, to make a connection with ESA presentation, uh, even as a vet or anyone working with animal, uh, e taking into account natural behavior, vision, um, audition, hearing, and, and then, then if you take into account this, uh, you, you make sure that you won't stress, you won't fear the animal, you, you, you will you can get into contact uh, without um, stressing the animal. Yeah, I would say as a veterinarian or as a, any, train your stock person that work with you in the, uh, in, the, in the race, in the shoot. When you do vaccination, whatever, it's very important that you have trained persons there 
because mm. if uh, if they're aggressive, if they shout, if they hit, you'll get uh, cows that are will always be afraid. So okay. you, you have to have trained, trained and uh, a really good person working there. It's not just anyone. That's a good point. It's, as I said also at the beginning of the webinar, it's not just the farmers who are concerned with this, but also the handlers, the stock person, the transporters and slaughterhouses and so on. Um, maybe a, a, a quick question still to for Isa. I, I just thought about these um, sea journeys or sea transports and I was a bit shocked about sort of the, the mortality cases there, which you just briefly mentioned. Maybe there were just two special examples, but is that a common thing in sea transports of, of cattle that the mortalities are quite high there? And if so, what, what would be the main reasons for the mortality? So yes, um, I think the, mo the the biggest problem concerning these mortality rates is that there's no database. So we don't know anything about what happens on sea because there's no official veterinarian or there's no uh, feedback mechanism to the member states, uh, to the state uh, where the, the origin is from this um, cattle. And so, um, it's like a black box, I think. So NGOs report about mortalities and I think, yes, um, it's, I think it's um, the most important uh, high numbers and high rates for, for the, um, the audience of NGOs to, to report on very high volumes of, so I think that can be a reason why these numbers are so high, but I also think why should they they fake these uh, rates. So I think they report what they get. And um, so th I think the reasons for these high rates are mostly the livestock vessels and the um, that they are in a very um, poor, um, um, yeah, they, they, yeah, condition. And um, they are not, they are approved, but they, the most of the, um, the um, livestock carriers, they fly under the, the black or the gray um, flag. So I think um, it's about 70% um, um, under the black or gray flag. Okay. And that's um, very bad. So the, the mechanism for um, approval of livestock carriers is, is not the best. So um, the report also mentioned that um, there are a lot of um, inspections for these uh, ships and um, also a lot of uh, detentions. And um, so it's not the safest way for transporting animals. Yeah. So, okay. So the regulations are definitely not as uh, organized or set down like for, for land transports. Yeah, I think that so now the, the, um, the, regula the um, regulation is revised and maybe there will be uh, some more um, requirements included in the new transport regulation, but um, I don't know. So okay. I would like to have some about uh, the weather conditions or how, what should be there on a um, transport vessel yeah. and yeah. what is required and. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Isa. Um, yeah, there's, so I can't see another question in the chat box. Um, and we also a bit over time already now. If there's no pressing question, then I would really like to thank you all for these nice talks and coming together here this evening. And as I said, if there are no more pressing questions, I thank you all and say, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.